Okay. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougal. I'm their daughter and your host, Heather McDougal. And tonight, just like every night, we're going to get to some latest news and then general questions. So first, I wanted to say hi to you, mom and dad, Dr. McDougal and Mary. How are you? Hello. Great well, to we're see just you. doing fine, Heather. <laughs> You know, but we really look forward to our five o'clock sessions every uh, Sunday night at <clears throat> Pacific time. We'll get a chance to meet with you folks. And I hope you're spreading the good news because there are a lot of sick people out there, I'll tell you. And, uh, you know, we have, well, we have a good answer for them, a real simple answer. And, well, I don't know, should I just get into what, I, what has been bothering me this week, Heather? <laughs> you know, I, I get involved Go ahead. in topics and it's because, you know, I keep learning things all the time, and mostly I have to tell you, it's basically a refinement of things that I fortunately would, was able to discover about 40 years ago. So I want to talk to you about a little bit about that tonight, and then we'll get on with questions. Uh, heart disease. Heart disease affects, what, half the population at least. And uh, let's talk a little bit about heart disease. And I gave you some references there. All right, I lost you. I got you there, Heather? Yeah, she's still there. Yeah. I'm here. Yeah, well, that's beautiful. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> anyway. Well, you're screen sharing, but I can't. So there we go. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Well, I don't know. Sometimes, Heather, I think I need to go back to college. <laughs> Can you see it okay now? Yeah, it's great. All right. So what I wanted to talk to you about is I, I was reading in the cardiac journals and I was reading about one of the dilemmas that uh, the cardiac business has, and that is finding the culprit lesion. You know, they're trying to find something to operate on to fix so that they can help people. I think doctors want to help people. What I want to talk to you about if, in the next couple of minutes is that by eating the Western diet, you cause injury to the arteries. And the response to injury is inflammation, like you smoke cigarettes, your lungs get inflamed. You, you get uh, a sunburn and your skin gets inflamed. Red, heat, pain, warmth, signs of inflammation. And if something involves a foreign object, then the body takes and infiltrates the foreign uh, object, the foreign body, like for example, cholesterol and fat, get into the artery walls and it causes inflammation and injury and healing and so on. And Posture formation and scars and just a whole bunch of sick tissue. The arteries are. Let's take a look at this. Let's see if we can get this going here. Oh, here we go. This is what doctors see on angiograms. Uh, if you have any chest pain, this is the gold standard, so to speak, because this is this is the uh, this is the 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 conveyor belt to the operating room. <laughs> you you get on a treadmill and it takes you right to the operating room, or or this happens to be the operating theater that takes you to a surgical procedure such as bypass or angioplasty. But what happens is you get inflammation. You see here, the arrows are pointing towards the end stage of inflammation, which is scar tissue. All right. <clears throat> With healing, what happens is you get inflammation. Like for example, if you get um, injury to your tendons or your bursas, they become inflamed. If the doctor were gonna take an X-ray of that tendon or bursa, they see calcification. Okay, if you had tuberculosis of the lungs, the classic sign for TB of the lungs is miliary tuberculosis. You get thousands of calcifications. If you happen to have uh, injury to your breasts from the rich Western diet, your milk duct ductals, they develop calcification in the milk ductals. So you get calcification as the end stage inflammation. And what we're looking at here is calcification of the coronary artery on the right-hand side of the slide. The, 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 the bright white deposits that you see there are calcium deposits. They're laid within scar tissue. Would that be like getting a callus on your finger? Well, it'd be more, like, more, like, it, it'd be more like somebody cutting you yeah. and the wound healing and you have a scar left. But but it's also not, it, does, it it's not smooth skin anymore. No, but if you had if you had something that was constantly irritating it, oh, you would okay. develop a, yeah. you'd develop a thick a yeah. thick scar. Well, that's, that's what I was thinking about a callus. If you walk yeah, on well, your that's, feet that's, wrong. that's more of a superficial thing. This is deep injury. Okay. So anyway, we have these calcifications in here. 
And, and that's what doctors see on the angiogram. You see these, these swellings, these uh, fibrous areas. Well, the problem is, is that doctors don't have a way to treat the killing part of the disease, which I'm going to talk to you about now. All we do is treat the old scars, the calcified scars, the non-lethal scars. That's what we treat because that's what we can see on angiogram. And that's all we can see. And we only have instrumentation to go in and squash or cut or laser treatment of the scars. We don't have any inflammation to any, any treatments to treat the killing part of the disease. Well, the killing part of the disease is this little postula you see over on the right-hand side of your slide. You see, you get inflammation of the arteries, which is the stages you see here. You get buildup of, like you say, Mary, you see how thick it gets? Yeah. Okay, and then you get calcium laid down as the end stage. But what you have during all of this inflammation and the sickness in your artery walls is you get these pustules. So that yellow stuff. Yeah, that yellow stuff. Okay. Like a, teenage, like a pimple on a teenager's face. Okay. And it bursts. These pimples are inside your arteries. They burst. Now, these pimples are filled up with uh, necrotic material. They're not calcified. You can't see them on angiogram. All right. So here's here's a, a demonstration of what happens here. You have injury of the inside line of the arteries. The result is a festering sore, you know, just like you were going to burn your hand or throw acid on your hand or get an infection. You get, an, uh, you get a, a sore as the healing process. And that sore develops uh, with an inner core of some other necrotic material, which bursts. And that causes a heart attack. Let me show you. You see, this is something I put in a book that I published in 1996. You see the, the, the injury there, the plaque. You see the fissure developing the plaque. And the inner contents of semi-liquid necrotic material is what comes spurting out of the plaque and causes the blood to clot. Now, this is important for you to understand because we don't have any way to treat this. We can't even predict which plaques are gonna rupture. We're darn sure just by you know taking care of probably several million people that the hard, hard fibrous plaques don't kill. All right, so here, here's a kind of a video illustration of what goes on. You have injury to the artery walls, all right? And you have this posture material, which is in yellow developing behind it. And then you develop a crack in the inside line of the artery walls. Okay, what we're going to focus on is this. this oh, there's the crack. Yeah, you see the crack, and you see the, the pustule developing there. Okay, that's how you get a heart attack. What lies distal dies. All right. So what we want to identify is we don't identify these culprit lesions, these uh, not high fi hard fibrous plaques which are being treated. But we, want to, uh, we want to be able to identify the volatile hot plaques that rupture. And that's what doctors are trying to do now. And that's what I gave you three up-to-date references on, is this has been a pursuit the doctors had have had since they started studying a heart surgery back in the early 80s, is to find out which lesions are gonna pop. Here's a, a, a final illustration I give you from the University of Pennsylvania. Let's see if we can get this going here. You have listened carefully. In healthy coronary artery, the blood flows without obstruction. In diseased coronary arteries, a fatty substance called plaque forms in the artery walls. And as the disease advances, may bulge out into the path of the onrushing blood, blocking the oxygen and nutrients the heart desperately needs. And from time to time, causing symptoms like chest pains and shortness of breath. But heart attacks result more often from plaque that does not protrude into the artery itself, but remains hidden in the artery wall. One of the scariest things about coronary artery disease is that it can remain silent for so long. You can have plaque buildup in the coronary artery that isn't causing you any problems, doesn't cause you any symptoms, doesn't even cause a positive stress test but suddenly ruptures. It ruptures, it causes the blood clot to form, the rest of the coronary artery, the rest of the pipe suddenly gets blocked and a heart attack occurs. And that's really the most common cause of heart attack. This is- Okay, so do you understand what's going on here? You've got a diseased artery walls in various stages of healing. In the early stages, you've got these volatile pustule plaques in the late stage of healing, you've got scar tissue and calcification. 
Doctors only know how to identify and treat the hard fiber scars. What the three scientific papers I gave you was, was uh, were dedicated towards efforts to identify which plaques are likely to rupture. We know the hard fibrous plaques, which we're treating with heart surgery, don't rupture. We don't have any instrumentation to treat the volatile plaques, but we're at least trying to identify them. And that's what those research papers I gave you. This is this was, you know, this was discovered in the 1980s. And you ask me whether doctors are still have the same understanding of pursuing the same issues. So uh, which which plaques are most likely to rupture? The ones that are most filled with junk, with necrotic material, with fat. And you couldn't tell that. Well, actually, on on the new the new computerized um, CAT scans that they do, they can get some characteristics of the plaque. And the ones that are filling up with a whole bunch of gunk, you'd expect. Them, oh, really? Yeah, you oh, could. Okay. They're starting, and that's what one of the papers is about. They're starting to be, able, and and also, you know, the early early calcification. There's certain characteristics that the plaques look like. All right, so I wanted to tell you that, and then we go and we treat with an angioplasty. We treat these hard fiber scars. But right? You must, I mean, how do you decide which person to do a CAT scan on to see whether there's a, well, a volatile plaque? Let's, let's just assume half the people uh, die from heart disease and stroke. So it's pretty common. Yeah. So when anybody comes to a doctor, emergency room with chest pain, plastic they symptoms are. Do it? Well, they do often. No, oh, okay. They shouldn't. I mean, it, the first step when somebody has blocked arteries is not heart surgery. It's uh, uh, good medical therapy, like uh, doctors include good medical therapy to think about in terms of aspirin, statins, and yeah. maybe maybe cutting your skin off your chicken <laughs> and, and, and low fat milk. I mean, that's really the armamentarium of most physicians. Anyway, the, what they do, Mary, in answer to your question is most people have these hard fibrous plaques, but they also have the volatile plaques going well, on at the same time. I know, but I, what I'm saying is, so if you go into the emergency room, and have a CAT scan, you can see which ones are volatile. You can't tell, but that's yeah. what they're working on. That's oh, what those okay. papers I gave you are trying to do. Because so they're trying. I mean, doctors really want to help people. But all, all that's available to them now is the hard fibrous plaques. So they can see them, they can find them, and they treat them. And you know why they treat them. All right. So anyway, we have multiple studies done. I'm going to go over them real quickly with you. You can run by the video afterwards and look up the studies. And you'll see that I'm I haven't left any out. These are all the studies done on the results of angioplasty, heart surgery. We're talking about sticking a catheter up your leg into your heart, blowing up these hard fibrous plaques. We've got, and I'll go through them quickly, the old study, no survival benefit, no reduction in death, no reduction in heart failure. We have the, the COURAGE study, same thing, no reduction in death, heart attacks, et cetera. We have 12 randomized trials. Here's 14 randomized trials, 15,000 people, no benefit, no survival benefit. How are you going to get a survival benefit when you treat the hard, fibrous, calcified, non-lethal plaques? So all those stents they put in, they're worthless. Well, there's no survival benefit. When people, when they go to the doctor with chest pain, doctor, you have a treatment that'll make me live longer yeah. or better at least. Well, you know, half the time, this procedure can relieve chest pain. Okay. Okay. But it doesn't cause survival. And that's what I want to show well, you. Survival is what, survival what, is what I, I want. What everybody's looking for. That's why I, went, that's why I paid the doctor thirty to $300,000. to yeah, Okay. All right. Here's, here's so totally clued, art, clued arteries that they totally opened up. No survival benefit. In really sick people like diabetics, no survival benefit in doing these procedures. People with severe heart failure, no survival benefit. See, when you've got a, a treatment that's a very weak benefit, you've got to apply it to very sick people to see any benefits. So they looked at really, 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 really sick people. No survival benefits. <laughs> anyway, there's another kind of procedure that we do that treats all the scars too. It's called open heart surgery. Where they open your chest. They put you on a heart lung machine, which causes brain damage, essentially 100% of the time. We don't have time to go into the cause of brain damage important heart surgery. But let's look at the results on survival benefits there. Here's the three studies, the CAS, the veterans, and the European study. They were all published in the 1980s. No survival benefit from treating hard fibrous plaques. All right, here, here are the studies. Uh, you can look them up. There's the three studies in case you want. Oh, 10 years? 
11 fair. years, 12 years? Yeah, in the 80s and 90s. Wow. Okay. All right. So we've done, they've done one more study, though. I want to show you that. Okay. Now. This is, is just published. It was published in 2016. Uh, in people with very severe, very severe disease. Remember, you know, weak therapy, if you apply it to really sick people, you can see some benefit. But no survival benefit at five years, a tiny bit of survival benefit at 10 years. Excuse me, I think you're not being given the truth. Anyway, uh, why are they doing this? 80% of the hospitals, whether they keep the hospital doors open or not, depends upon the heart surgery business. Oh, well, we hear about that here. They close hospitals because they don't have enough profit. Well, it's not because people are getting healthier. Well, I know that. <laughs> maybe they're doing, maybe they I don't know. Anyway, this is there's also an article I gave you on the effect of statins on plaque on plaque evolvement. You can read about that. You can see the statins make very little difference. And that's why when you look at the the, the benefits or lack of benefits of giving statins and heart disease, the lack of benefits out way outweigh the benefits. You know, and again, another issue which we've been misled for the last 20 years. The doctors used to say we should put statins in the drinking water. And look at how new those. Um, 22, yeah. Yeah. Those reports. Well, Heather, Heather objects that I haven't brought her the most up-to-date scientific research <laughs> that confirms things that I discovered years 47 ago. years, 47, 50 years ago. The truth's the truth that doesn't change. Read these three articles on plaque disease, and you'll see that doctors are still confused about what to do. They see these hard fibrous plaques. It's irresistible, especially since there's a, a $30,000 price tag attached to it. And they treat it with crude instrumentation, which is open heart surgery and angioplasty. Whereas when you stop the injuring part of the disease, which is the food, then the arteries heal. Okay, do the scars go away? Well, there's some evidence the scars will go away, but we know clearly with work from Carl Osterson, Dean Orange, Orange, David Blank, and Horn from UCLA, we know clearly this disease, it heals. But you got to go with the food. You're not going to heal with aspirin, statins, or any kind of surgery that deals with old fibrous scars. And if you figure out how to identify the volatile plaques and a way of treating the volatile plaques other than feeding people potatoes and <laughs> rice and broccoli, you could be a billionaire. All right, Heather, I'm ready for your part. Great, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to stop your screen sharing. How about your papers? Did you have any papers? Oh, well, I, I had a few, a few other things. I, you know, I read, I read the paper all the time. The news. Yeah, you printed out some good ones this week. That's old. You did that one already. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I don't know which ones I picked up, but I wanted to focus on the, the coronary oh, okay. disease. All right. So, you know, these people are going to be dealing with this, you know, their grandpa or their, their, their brother. I mean, how many people deal with heart disease? Half the population. Yeah. And we're, we're not talking about just heart attacks. We're talking about strokes, loss of vision, which is uh, uh, macular degeneration. We're talking about hearing loss, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago. When you plug the arteries with these, uh, these closures, these plaques, and that's why a lot of these things happen suddenly. You're perfectly well. Everything's just going wonderful. And bam, it hits. You know, uh, an elephant sat on my chest. All the, I was fine just two minutes ago. It was because of plaque rupture. I had a, a fellow medical student who went deaf in one ear during, during our medical training because he broke a plaque in his ear. <laughs> anyway, these, these things rupture all over the body. You've got, you know, th tens of thousands of miles of blood vessels that are diseased with Pustules that are ready to pop. Stop, stop aggravating them with the food. All right, Heather, your turn. Thank you. Okay, lots of questions coming in. Let's start out. Let's see, Alan has a question and wants to know if you have any comments on the Framingham risk score. Yeah, yeah. well, Raymond Framingham, that's from Framingham, Massachusetts. And it's a population in a community in Framingham, Massachusetts, <laughs> where they took the people there and they, they studied them to see what happened during the course of life. They didn't change anybody's diet, okay? I mean, they may have given them some casual dietary advice, but it was not a dietary program. 
and they made observations as to who had a tartar attack and what characteristics these people might have had. Like as they got older, they had more heart attacks. When they had higher cholesterol, they had more heart attacks. Uh, higher blood pressure, more heart attacks. So those are what are known as risk factors. And these would be the Framingham risk factors that were developed back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And you know that I, I use risk factors. You know, I tell you what, I don't ask you to treat risk factors. Remember, they're risk factors, not diseases. Nobody's died of high cholesterol. And I've been at this 55 years. I've never seen anybody die of high cholesterol. They die of rotten arteries from the bad food. Likewise, with high blood pressure, people don't really have strokes from high blood pressure. It's the rotten arteries that fail. You know, healthy blood vessels can stand pressures of like 400 over 250 millimeters of mercury or 300 millimeters of mercury. Healthy vessels don't break. Sick vessels break. So by treating the risk factors, the signs, the symptoms of disease, without treating the underlying disease, you don't get a survival benefit. Anyway, those are the Framingham risk factors. And by the way, out of Framingham, and they say that I was the one that made this observation, but you could prove me wrong. Uh, when I was studying the Framingham data, uh, what I noticed was that no one had a heart attack with a cholesterol less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. You divide, divide by 38 to get international units, by the way. So nobody uh, with a cholesterol less than 150 had a heart attack in the Framingham study. So I started talking about you know, places I went that you know, when people have, heart, have cholesterol 150, they're pretty much immune from heart disease. And that's been, I think, taken to uh, to a greater value than I really meant it to be because people have heart attacks that have cholesterol less than 150. Yeah, we've heard of them. Yeah. Not many, but well, a few. Sometimes what happens is somebody has a heart attack and they're sick and they don't eat. They go to the hospital and then they get the cholesterol checked. So that is part of the reason that you, you don't always see a, a, a high cholesterol with heart attacks. So they haven't eaten three or four days, so their cholesterol comes down. But, you know, cholesterol is a sign of disease. It's not the disease. You know, you can't treat signs and expect people to get better. Fever, fever is a sign of pneumonia. So if you give a patient aspirin and they lower their body temperature, but you don't treat the infection in the lung, guess what happens? They die with a normal body temperature. And it's the same thing with statins and other cholesterol-lowering drugs. If you lower the sign, like the fever, you lower the sign with drugs like aspirin, and you don't deal with the underlying disease, you die. <laughs> uh, that should make a lot of sense to you. Anyway, uh, these are signs. Uh, obesity is a sign. Uh, chest pain is a symptom. You know the difference between symptoms and signs? You know the difference, Heather? Well... No, okay. well, I'll tell you, it was a trick question. I know you'll explain it better than I will anyway. It was a trick question. <laughs> I just want, I, the signs are things you can see, that, that you observe. Symptoms are things patients tell you about. You know, so people have signs and symptoms. So cholesterol is a sign. Chest pain is a symptom. Oh, learn Thank something you. new on that. Sunday night, I right? Don't forget. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway. I didn't know that one either. <laughs> It's amazing what you learn in medical school. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Well, any, anyway, uh, next question, Heather. Okay, great. This is from Jody. She wrote in and she would love it if you could talk about lipedema. Like uh, lymphedema, L Y P H E. No, lipedema, this connective oh, tissue disorder causing large legs with overgrowth of adipose tissue. Okay, this is lymphedema, L Y P H. Well, no, she wrote L I P E D. -E. Yeah, I know, but it's not right. <laughs> Swelling the legs. Swelling the arms and the legs from having the lymph system, L Y N P H. The lymph system plugged up, you get lymphedema. Lipidemia is when you have lipids in the blood. Lipids are fats. So that's lipidemia. Lymph and they wouldn't cause swelling of the legs. No, that's lymphedema. She, she, she thinks filariasis, which is an infection with an organism, maybe a parasite. A little filariasis, you can correct me on that one. But they're little, there's a little worm, a little parasite that is in Africa, which infects the person and infects their lymph system. And you have the elephant man. Remember the elephant oh, man? Yeah. It was a big movie. Yeah. Uh, he had, uh, he had uh, well, I forget what they call it, uh, 
uh, there's a name for it besides Elephant Man. But he had uh, filariasis here. Look up. Okay. Anyway, so you get lymphedema that way. The most common reason I see lymphedema is in the arm. The arm on the affected side where some meddling doctor got in and took the lymph nodes, which he or she shouldn't have done because there's no survival benefit from taking the lymph nodes. And I can argue that the lymph nodes are there to defend you, to yeah. prevent you from dying of breast cancer. And if you damage them or take them out, you reduce your chances of living. But anyways, they take the lymph nodes out, then you don't get any drainage, you get swelling of the arm. And how do you treat, isn't that right, Mary? It's Proteus syndrome. Is that what they call it? I don't think, yeah, that's new. Because that's the elephant they, man. Yeah. Neurofibromatosis, that's what it's But called. that's what they said. It, that's what it was. They thought he had right. that, but it turned out that he really had that. Oh, well. Anyway, you get the point. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, the point being that uh, I don't think there's any effective way of treating this lymphedema. You can raise your arm. I, I, some women have come back to me and said once they change their diet, their whole body's less swollen and they got relief. But, you know, I wouldn't promise you that. I would certainly give it a try. See if it makes a difference. Compression, compression stockings might help. But it's, it's just terrible damage done to women unnecessarily. In fact, it's it's harmful to take the lymph nodes out. Totally unnecessary as far as determining treatment. Your doctors, your oncologists will give you the excuse that they needed the lymph nodes to determine the hormone status of a woman. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You could have figured it out from the tumor you took in the breast. Don't you tell me that. <laughs> Now, can we talk yeah, about the other one, yeah. lip, lipedema? Oh, lipedema is fat in the blood. It's triglycerides. That's, a, that's just, you get lipemic uh, blood. Uh, if I were to take some blood from your arm, your arm, Heather, or Mary's arm, if I take blood out and I would set the tube of blood on a counter, the red blood cells being heavier than the fat would settle to the bottom, Okay. And so you'd have a layer of red, and then you have a layer of yellow on top. That's the fat. That's the lipids. There are people who have such high lipid levels in their blood called triglycerides. Okay, they're fat, and that's fat in the blood. That When you draw the blood out of their arm through the tube, before you take the needle out of their arm, the blood has started to separate into fat and red blood cells right in the tube. That's how full of fat they are. This fat You've seen the, the videos I've shown you about blood sludging. Okay, it causes the cells to stick together. It drops the oxygen content in the blood by somewhere between 5 and 20%. It causes chest pain. And so one of the fundamental treatments we talked about, uh, no, we've talked about it, we can talk about it again sometime, is a low-fat diet stops chest pain. Chest pain is the indication for heart surgery. Because, as I told you in the beginning of this presentation, heart surgery doesn't save lives. <laughs> so why else can you do it? What other excuse do you give the patient? It relieves chest pain. Well, ladies and gentlemen, just stop eating the garbage and the chest pain will go away. That's a time-honored treatment. Stop the lipemia. Where do you get blood fat from? From the fat on your plate. <laughs> and also eat a lot of other junk, but, you know. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next question. This is from Candy. She has entered menopause and has been whole food plant-based for 20 years, but has suddenly gained 20 pounds. Her cholesterol has gone up 50 points. So she's wondering if hormone replacement therapy would help. Probably not. This is one of these people that gains, I'm not, I'm not going to make a joke about it, but you, 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 it just going through menopause shouldn't cause you to. It should cause you poor health. This is this is a normal, natural time in a woman's life. It's not a sickness. You just stop making eggs, so your ovaries don't make eggs anymore. And from the time, and you then you stop your period. Then you can't have babies. But after say forty eight years old, you're not supposed to be having babies. Who's going to raise the kids? It's okay for men. Men, you know, can live longer, die soon. Doesn't matter. But women, you got to have another twenty years <laughs> to act like mothers and to make these sure these kids grow up. That's why you don't have babies when you're eighty-two years old. 
<laughs> you'd have no time to raise them. So menopause, first of all, is not a sickness. And starting on hormone replacement therapy would be indicated if you had menopausal symptoms, if you wanted to, uh, well, I think it, it's a little bit anti-aging. I think, I think taking estrogens it, uh, is pretty conclusive that it causes women to age, at least as far as outside signs of beauty go, skin, et cetera. Estrogen will help you in that way, slowing the obvious aging trouble. Uh, increases your risk of uterine cancer dramatically. Taking hormones increases your risk of breast cancer by about two, twice. Doubles your risk of gallbladder disease. Actually, increases by about two and a half times. So you want to well, make sure that, you're eating well. Well, all that's nobody's ever studied that. That's the problem, Mary. Is they've only studied sick people. My um, guess is they wouldn't have any trouble. Yeah, I mean, if if you were eating a healthy diet and then you took hormone replacement therapy, all those other things you don't have to worry about anyway. Well, you don't get gallbladder disease when you eat a healthy diet. Yeah. You don't get uterine cancer when you eat a healthy diet. You, know, you, know, you see these diseases, heart disease, uterine cancer, and breast cancer are unknown to occur in populations that eat a diet based on starch. Like the Japanese, the Chinese, the people from Thailand before World War II. They were rice-based diets. They didn't have any of these problems. They do now. <laughs> they do now. <laughs> thanks to cable news network, thanks to transportation, thanks to fossil fuels, we can make everybody sick with animal foods and oils. That's where you get these problems. Animal foods and oils, you can solve them, prevent illness, and cure a lot of the problems. Not all of them, but a lot of the problems by switching back to a starch-based diet. You know, like grandma used to eat. You go over to grandma's house and <laughs> what's for dinner, grandma? Well, we're going to have... Uh, uh, potatoes, or we're going to have pasta, or we're going to have bushu vegetables and rice. And you know, now you go to, to go, you get you go home, and you go, what's for dinner? Chicken. <laughs> what's for dinner? Beef. You know, it's it's different. It used to be what's for dinner? Pasta. What's for dinner? Rice. What's for dinner? It used to be that way. It wasn't only but a couple of generations ago. This has all happened within my lifetime. Yeah, in the 1900s, basically. My my great grandfather died at 87 years old. He lived in his <laughs> early years. He was a jockey. He worked on the East Coast uh, riding horses. And, you know, he was a jockey, little guy. He lived on beans and potatoes the first 50 years of his life because he had no money. And then he got money. <laughs> And he lived on eggs and meatballs and onions the rest of his life. And by the time he died at 87, he had such severe atherosclerosis of his leg arteries. He couldn't walk up the stairs. That's how close his leg arteries. He arteries. couldn't even walk across the room. He died of kidney failure. Finally, his arteries to his kidney. Yeah, he couldn't walk. But so, you know, it's all happened in the last 50 years. Your grandma and grandpa, unless they were really, really rich, didn't have these problems. My my grandpa wasn't really very really rich. Beans and beans and potatoes. That was his <laughs> diet. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Next question. Um, let's see. B Daily wrote in and he said, recently I came across berberine called the poor man's Ozempic. Is it safe <laughs> or is it reptile venom like Ozempic? No, no. <laughs> I, 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 the things I don't, I need to learn more about berberine. Oh, I heard, well, I, 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 do a, I know I've got to do a whole bunch of study though, Mary. Yeah. I mean, this is just a really powerful yeah. herb. It lowers cholesterol, but has not been shown to reduce the risk of dying of heart disease. I haven't heard it used as a weight loss drug though. I don't know. You hear the train? No. Good. <laughs> uh, and it's loud. They have this this special steam train that runs along the river. It's kind of like a Santa Claus thing. Mm -hmm. And so they have a, the Santa train that runs back and forth across around the river. So we have to we have to work work. But my guess is, and it's the only guess based on not no science yet, because they haven't studied it. My guess is this is just a a, a powerful herb that deals with signs and symptoms. So, 
uh -huh. bitter tasting yellow colored chemical. It might help strengthen the heartbeat. It might also kill bacteria, help regulate how, how the body uses sugar. It's kind of like Ozempic. It does everything. Yeah. These new ads about Ozempic does and everything. What's appeared in your local press? A couple of interesting things. One is that, uh, that business has gone down dramatically because of Ozempic. People aren't buying the food. They're not buying the junk food. They're not buying the groceries. They're not going out to eat. And this is this has a, a runoff, a spill. They're not as sick. They're not going to the hospital to the doctor as much. They're not buying as many drugs. <laughs> Ozempic is a bad thing for the business. <laughs> because, they will have taken off the market for just that reason, probably. Maybe, yeah. Well, you, you know, you could, you could, you know, Ozempic was one way. Reptile poisoning is one way to do it. But you could also wire, wire people's teeth together. Or what if there was no food? What if there was no food? What yeah. would happen? Everybody would get them. Heart disease would disappear. What would cardiologists do? There would be no, no breast cancer if we had to change our diet drastically because of circumstances. What if people had to eat? Like we No, not like <laughs> us. We eat like kings and queens. What if people had to eat like they did? in my grandpa's day or in your grandma and grandpa's day what if there wasn't a refrigeration Just beans what if beans. transportation wasn't there what if the suez canal was was dried up and the panama canal and they couldn't they couldn't get all that goody goody to our door on time what if that happened we could see quite a change couldn't we we could yeah really <laughs> you, you and i would be past amy we, 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 we have no place if, if the diet changes in the world which i have good reason to believe it's going on then Mary and I are out of business. I think we'll be gone by then anyway. Fortunately, we live on rice, which is cheap. Otherwise, we're going to be in big trouble too. All right, Heather, I'm getting silly. We need to go on. Okay, next question. What do you feel about someone that loves to snack on oil-free pretzels? Uh, it's, it's white flour, you know, it's salt. So not the best. No snack. Festival, low not fat. terrible, but it depends on how, whether you make, um, you know, two percent of your diet salty, you know, no oil, no cholesterol pretzels, or you know, eighty-two percent. You know, that's a <laughs> lot of empty calories. That's a lot of lack of nutrients, of phytonutrients. And I don't think that'd be a good idea. Probably you get berry berry. Just like they did when they refined the rice. You mean if they only ate they, white, rice, white rice flour? I, I'd have to see what white rice flour is deficient in. But well, my guess is B vitamins and uh, maybe tryptophan. Uh, you know, the B vitamins are probably you probably develop a B vitamin deficiency if you just try to live on the majority diet as, as pretzels. But that's not what they're asking. They're asking them just what few, about snack foods? As I can I, food. I can do a little bit of anything and get away with it. <laughs> the problem That's I have, true. just like you folks, is I can't do a little bit. I either do it or don't do it. And that you're, you know, Mary's kind of a moderate person, and uh, she would have likely lived in good health, a little heavier, but in good health uh, uh, without me. Not me though. I needed Mary to kind of calm me down, put things in perspective, and make me a little bit more moderate because because I was intent before we met on smoking, drinking, and eating myself to death. But I did a pretty damn good job of it. At 18, I had a stroke. I used to be probably 90 pounds heavier than I am now. I had a major abdominal surgery in my mid-20s. I don't think I made it to my <laughs> late 20s or 30s if we hadn't met Mary. Maybe not. You really gave me. Because I'm not a modern person, and no, neither are you. Okay, that's why you're in trouble. You know, part of it is you may have listened to the wrong people. The other is you're, you're the kind of person that gets a big bang out of life like me. I, I'm a great, great double A personality. I just <laughs> go for everything a thousand percent. So you got to teach me the right rules. Otherwise, I'll kill myself. You teach me that booze is good for me because it will reduce my risk of dying of heart disease. Guess what? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm going to listen to. You tell me if I smoke cigarettes, I'll exercise my lungs. That's all I'm going to hear. <laughs> You know, it, we're we're just terrible. Human beings are terrible. Well, well, I think we can guard against some of our na natural behaviors. 
if we have the truth, if we have the information. But if we're lied to, we don't stand a chance. You're being lied to. It's the food. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from Sunshine. She has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and is wondering what the best diet is. Well, the best diet is our diet. Uh, Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is, well, let me, uh, there, there's no dietary cure that no, anyone knows. Uh, the uh, a tr a True North has recently taken care of somebody, I believe it was a, a, a lymphoma. And whether it was non-Hodgkin's or Hodgkin's, I don't know, but they published their study in the British Medical Journal. A True North uses our diet without salt and sugar, but they also fast people. It's a water fast. So that's the only positive thing I can tell you about diet. True North got a, um, a cure enough so that it got published in the, one of the major medical journals in the world, British Medical Journal. And that was through water fasting and going on our diet. Uh, but I would look, I would certainly, I would look into the science and see what the outcomes are as far as present therapies for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I don't know what they are these days. I haven't looked at it. But I would be real careful about looking at that science and before I accepted therapies. What causes non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Let me tell you about a guy named Alan Cunningham, published in The Lancet, I believe in 1979. You can look it up. Uh, Alan Cunningham. Alan Cunningham, he came out with the idea that lymphomas were due to overstimulation of the immune system by animal protein, particularly beef protein and dairy protein. Alan Cunningham, Lancet, 1979. Okay, so the way he, what he did is he told a story about Dennis Burkett. You've heard me talk about it, the Burkett diet, the Burkett lymphoma. Dennis Burkett was an Edinburgh, Scotland surgeon. I've talked to you about who went to Uganda, Africa. In Africa, he discovered something called Burkett's lymphoma. Pretty cool, huh? He got this lymphoma named after him. <laughs> Burkitt's lymphoma is due to overstimulation of the immune system, the lymph, lymph system, by constant parasite attacks by malaria parasites. Through constant, you know, there, there's chronic infection of malaria in that part of the world. So through chronic infection and dealing with these parasites all day long, the immune system gets overtaxed and breaks down into Burkitt's lymphoma. The analogy that Alan Cunningham carried on from here was that eating cow protein, particularly focused on dairy and beef protein, the, that protein acted just like the parasites, overstimulating the immune system, causing it to break down into lymphomas. I think that's pretty cool. Anyway, uh, again, a, a dietary disease, get rid of the beef, get rid of the milk, <laughs> but it could be due to other things. And uh, unfortunately, the, I don't remember the treatments being all that good. I certainly would eat a good diet, though. But if they're good treatments, take them. How do you know if a treatment's good? Well, you got to read the science. And you got to look at randomized control trials. And then you've got to look to see what happens as far as the most important thing you're concerned about. And that's staying alive. I just showed you at the beginning of this presentation. I just showed you all the studies on heart surgery. All of them didn't leave any out. They don't save lives. Why? Because they treat old, hard, hard fibrous calcified plaques. That's what. And they don't make them change their diet either. Mary, they feed in hospitals the very food that brought people to the hospital. Oh, in the first yeah, place. I know. The, the food service of a hospital deserves a kickback <laughs> from the pharmacy and the surgery. Because here you have a teaching moment. You're laying there. You've just had something horrible happen to you. And you're saying to your doctors and your nurses, please tell me, I don't want to ever have this happen to me again. Please tell me what to do. Well, you got to make sure you got your, get your protein because you got to heal this big wound we just put in your chest. So you better eat your hamburger. You know, a teaching moment. You know, the doctors should know, and many of them do know, all the things I'm telling you, yet this is a business. You think they would make money passing out potatoes in the hospitals that I've worked at or curing people? 
No, you keep the doors open by doing things that are profitable. 80% of the income of a hospital that deals in heart surgery comes from heart disease. These people aren't stupid. <laughs> They're running businesses. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're the commodity. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from A.A. Strumming. Uh, let's see. Their mother has varicose veins. The doctor wants to do radio frequency ablation and use yeah. varathena in the vein. Can fixing her diet help? No, <laughs> no, no. It, it, but if it cosmetically they bother her, we used to inject them with a small syringe and a small needle with a sclerosing solution. It could be high, a high, a high salt solution, for example, would do it. Did you ever have that done? Mm -hmm. You did, yeah. You had some little veins? Little veins. Okay. Not, so, not, I didn't have any big ones, but I had after, yeah. spider veins. Spider veins, right. So you inject these little veins, and this is a similar procedure. It's a sclerosing effort to take and uh, damage, destroy these tiny little blood vessels that are protruding from your skin that you don't like. Have it done. Laser will do it. There are several treatments for cosmetic reasons, but don't have it done for your health. You know, treating those little veins is okay, but we used to treat big veins. And Mary, you, you've been on these surgeries where they... Uh, oh, well, they just strip the whole vein out. And they, tell, them, well, tell them what they... Mary, oh. Mary's a surgical nurse. <laughs> that was terrible. Tell, do you remember how they did that? Well, they open up a little part of the... um, Like by the knee and then another part down by the ankle. Oh, you remember more than I do. <laughs> and, and they would take, grab... They would cut the vein and stitch up the end. Yeah, and I, they I remember that part. They that whole piece of vein right out through the ankle. You want to talk about lymphedema. <laughs> <laughs> That's just good. Yeah, this this is awful. actually a venous problem. Uh, they, they pulled it. it was, you got this big, long, it's like all on the side of a garden hose. You know, it's like, depending on how tall the woman is, it's usually a woman. You've got, you've got like four or five, six feet of garden hose. They just stripped out of your leg. Where do you think the blood gets to go now? In little tiny veins. Because in the little tiny veins. And guess what? You get more superficial varicose veins. And you get a swollen leg and pain and a lot of other things. They don't do that. I don't think they do that anymore. Would they do that? I don't know. It's been a long time, so probably not. <laughs> maybe they have something better. More, more profitable. <laughs> oh, maybe. I don't know. You know, the, the goal is to maintain as good, much good health as you can. And to reverse much as much disease as you can. Then, unfortunately, because you know we've been, not been living by the right set of rules, unfortunately, many, many of us have scars from our old habits. And, you know, if you knew me, I'm 76 years old now, but at 18 years old, I had a massive stroke. I lost the entire left side of my body, and you know, through my through my life, I did okay. I flew airplanes. I Sailed ocean goat sailboats. I sailed the windsurfer. I was never very pretty. I I would ski down black diamonds, but you didn't look at me saying, look at the skier and say, boy, he looks good. He looks horrible. I hope he survives. Get down the hill. <laughs> it's, it's been a real handicap for me for well since I was eighteen. But that scar won't ever go away. All right, all right. So my mother believed that eggs and chicken and beef were important for calcium and protein and. You know, if she's still alive today, I'd be careful about her seeing this video, but she's not. <laughs> she lived to be 93. 93. Yeah, I think so. Anyway, uh, she, she felt terrible after I had my stroke at 18. Every time she'd look at me, she, she, I know she thought, I did this to my son. Well, Mom, you didn't know any better. And your parents likely did the same thing to you. But now you know. Don't do it to your kids. Don't do it to your grandkids. So... You're left with scars. What I was trying to say is because uh, on unfortunate information, we're left with scars. And these scars sometimes maintain themselves. We lose hearing, one ear, lose an eye, stroke, heart attack. So anyway, I, I've done okay. But I guess the reason I've gotten to this point is that now that I'm 76, I'm losing a little bit of my you know, previous reserve. And uh, I don't think I'd get back on that windsurfer. I don't know they let me fly an airplane. <laughs> 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 Well, you know, I'm getting old, folks. Catch me while you can. <laughs>
So I don't have a guy on that question either. I don't either. <laughs> okay, next question. Do you have any positive, Gary wrote in, Gary wrote in, me an email. He's doing amazingly well, but he has a friend who has polysemia, polysemia vera. Yeah, polysemia vera. Uh, again, you're you're reaching back in my career. Oh, I never heard it's, of that. It's an one. autoimmune disease. Well, of course. Polysemia vera. And poly, uh, it refers to colored pigmentate, pigmented lesions that occur related to the blood vessels, I believe, on the leg mostly. And, uh, you know, like most autoimmune diseases, it's caused by what you eat. So I would suspect that it's not going to go away. I'd expect this is one of the, the one of the remnants of damage that you have from your previous education. But, well, what if you change but, your diet? And then it might go away. No? You could try. Yeah, why not? Okay. There's no sense in believing that a virus causes polysemia vera. I mean, we, we, we learned that as a possible theory in medical school as a virus. We also learned it was an autoimmune disease. But we never learned that autoimmune diseases had to do with anything, but maybe a virus, maybe bad luck, maybe the wrath of God, maybe bad genes, could be bad genes, or maybe something we haven't discovered. It couldn't be the food. <laughs> couldn't possibly be the food. <laughs> you can eat anything and everything you want. Just eat a well-balanced diet. Yes, you'll be okay. <laughs> laughing, but people are actually told that. Which is oh, of oh, yeah, really, that's my eyes were just, just and, and Heather, the real insult to me physically was for my parents to be taught that protein and calcium were the most important nutrients for them to feed me. When there's never been a case of either protein or calcium deficiency ever described in a human being on any natural diet, it doesn't exist. But the industry is powerful. They got money. So anyway, you, you same thing. You had parents with that kind of education too. And your parents want to do good things for you. My parents went through the depression. They had to live on turnips and potatoes. My mother did. And she would have been one of those homeless people, my mother, that we see so often today, except for the fact that her landlord gave her family free rent where they didn't have to live on the street. But my mother said, my mother said that she would never let her children suffer like she did. And we didn't. But we suffered because she didn't learn the right message. Well, they had no idea back then. Uh, no, not nobody, much. Nobody was you know, back, was she born in 1920, something like that? Probably, yeah. Back then we had, we had, uh, we had uh, uh, Mikhail Hinhidi from the Netherlands that knew there was no such thing as protein deficiency. You know, there are all kinds of researchers back well, then. But they never talked about it in, in like women's magazines. Well, or it's because like it's because just like today, it, you know, if you have the money, you can carry the message. The money carries the message. And if you believe differently, you're not living on planet Earth like I am. <laughs> so <laughs> figure it out, folks. <laughs> it, you know, they don't much care. Okay, next question. This is from Donna. Uh, can mild pulmonary hypertension be helped with diet? I think so. I think so. Uh, this is, uh, you know, there's every, again, Heather, you know, I'm, you've been known for so long, like almost 50 years, but you realize that I'm like a broken record. I, I just naturally go back to the food as a possibility. And like arterial hypertension is due to increased peripheral resistance in the arterial system into which the blood, the heart pumps blood. Well, pulmonary hypertension is in the venous system that drains the lungs, you get a resistance to flow. And so because of the higher pressure, well, you know, there's every reason to believe the pressures in the eye and the venous side of the system we know for sure on the arterial side of the system are influenced by what we eat. You've got to open up the blood vessels. You do that with good food. You lower the volume in the body, volume, you know, the amount of fluid by low salt. So low salt, I'm extremely low salt, like Kempner, will decrease the volume so the pressure in the lungs and the heart goes down and the eyes. You know, I, I say that with limited data, the eyes and the 
I'll look up the pulmonary hypertension and see what work has been done on diet. But yeah, I, I listen, until until you've changed to a starch-based diet for four months, okay, 12 days, or oh, maybe <laughs> even seven. But let's, let's make it fair, okay? Until you've eaten a starch-based diet, cleaned up your bad habits, gone for a walk, get a little sunshine for four months, do not declare yourself incurably ill because you're not because you're not living in an environment that supports your health and healing. That environment is based on starch, corn, rice, potatoes, sweet potatoes. We had sweet potatoes for lunch today. We had leftover sweet potatoes for lunch and green beans. Yes. Yeah. So it was good lunch. It was good. It was good. Just as good as the night we had them. Well, you know, you're, you're, you cook very simple and don't spend a lot of time in the kitchen these days, but I'll tell you what comes out of the kitchen, Mary, is really amazing. <laughs> Jason, you know, we were going to, uh, we we're entertaining a couple of options tonight. One was, there's a, uh, a Vietnamese restaurant close to us that really serves oil-free, clean food, but it's expensive. <laughs> and the other option was fried rice. Fried rice. And guess what your, your son chose? Fried rice, really? Wow, I would. Have yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, 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 he loves the, the Vietnamese restaurant, and, but yeah, he he wanted to so know after after this session today, how much time we spend on about ten minutes. Ten minutes, a lot easier than having DoorDash come to the place. <laughs> Take a lot longer for DoorDash. Yeah, really. Well, they get the order wrong. You never get the order wrong. <laughs> Anyway, uh, oh, you're missing an opportunity if you're not doing what we suggest. And your friends and relatives are really missing an opportunity if you haven't at least asked them to let us open their eyes. You know, let, let us give you give you a chance while we have an opportunity to tell you what the truth is. Let's, let's build an army. Let's build a revolution. Let's change the world to a better place because you can do it along, along with our help. I think so. Sure like to try. <laughs> no more than I like to, you know, have people save themselves and the planet. No. Okay, we've got a few minutes left, so I think I can I can cram a couple more questions in here. Cultivating Joy wrote in. She's starting out on the maximum weight loss program and wants to know what a s serving is of fruit. Is it an apple, a whole banana? Mm. Does it really matter? Or a whole watermelon? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Just a well, I usually say a cup. Yeah. You know, so that would be like an apple or a, one banana yeah, or I, um, I, I think one orange. Most people know what a serving size Half is. Half a grapefruit. You know. Oh, maybe a, like this many, what was mm -hmm. this many blueberries. I, I don't think that's a tough question to answer. But we, we've got sweet potatoes today that are probably two certain <laughs> size. We got sweet yeah, potatoes, sweet potatoes that, are that big. <laughs> and, and when we looked at them this morning, you know, I said, Mary, we could we won't be able to eat even one of those between the two of us. Maybe no, 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 you, no we can't. Okay, no. one. But we got these three gorgeous. <laughs> there's more than a serving size. It's two serving <laughs> size sweet potatoes. I'm sorry, I can't give you a more definite answer. Just kind of look at it. A banana is a serving size. A cup of fruit is a serving size. Good enough. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. It's just like we tell you to eat. You know, I tell you to eat 90% of your diet is starch. Mary says 70 will do. You know, it's not that strict of guidelines. You just need to get the principles right. Animal foods and oils are poisons. They are killing you. Corn oil, safflower oil. <laughs> Canola oil, any fruit oils are killing you. Animals, whether they be their you know, parts of their bodies, like their livers and their muscles and their brains and their feet, or secretions from animals such as milk or blood. I would not consider a secretion or a body part. You know, mm -hmm. they make they make they make no, sausage out of blood. Yeah, but you have to kill the animal to get that. You don't have to kill the animal. To okay, get okay. The I take secretion. I take blood sausages out of that category of secretions. We'll just <laughs> leave that at milk. <laughs> well, they do. They make sausages out of the leftovers at the slaughterhouse. Come on, guys. You're right. Yeah, blood sausage. It's even yeah. 
<laughs> they even see. call it that, yeah. <laughs> let's see, you got a tube of blood and muscle. <laughs> Or you've got a sweet potato. What are you going to choose? Ooh. Come on, what are you going to choose? Sweet potato. I know there was a day, a day when I would have picked the mussel. <laughs> if they spice, see the way they get away with the blood sausage, Heather, is they make it so heavy and spice that you can't taste the rest. What, what, is, the, what is the joke? If, if, if slaughterhouses uh, have glass walls, no one will eat meat. Yeah. Or uh, yeah. you know, one, one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to go to a slaughterhouse to see your meal prepared. This is disgusting. Come on, it's disgusting. <laughs> you're not, you're a better person than that. It's just like tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning, I'm going to give a lecture for Chef AJ's group on low carb diets. And, uh, you know, I, the audience I talk to tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock uh, on Chef AJ's YouTube channel, talking about low carb diets, I'll talk to you about the disadvantage of low carb diets, how they, you lose less weight when you get the carbs out of the diet. As, as opposed to keeping the carbs in. Kevin Hall's work. Kevin Hall was a guest at one of our advanced study weekends. He ruined uh, Gary Taub's life <laughs> by teaching this uh, the big fat lie author that he was full of... What would he be full Big fat of? lies? Big fat lies. <laughs> He's full of stuff because Kevin Hall proved it wrong. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. But one of the questions I asked, I showed a picture of a, a, a low carbers and what they eat. Why would you, how do you eat this stuff? I showed a picture of a slaughterhouse. Oh, pretty no. nasty. Yeah, pretty nasty. I also, pic I also showed a picture of a burning planet. Why, how do you do this? I mean, you know, maybe if you're not concerned about yourself and your family. They don't think about it. You go to the supermarket and everything is all packaged up and it looks really nice on the shelves and, you know. What does it look? You know, I, I want to question that for me, Mary. Who does it look nice? I, I, I when I used to go, oh, to the it looks nice to people that are shopping for meat products. They like bloody stuff. Well, you don't see the blood. They clean it off. Yeah. Put it in packages. Right. We're yeah. out of time. You guys are going to go on and on and on about this. <laughs> Gross. It's not our food. We definitely want to focus on starches, <laughs> grains, legumes, vegetables, and fruits. All right. That's a much better way to end this hour. <laughs> much Listen, you know, remember the fried rice. We're having a growing, we're growing census for this five o'clock Pacific time Sunday evening discussion that the three of us get together and have with you. So you're telling your friends and re relatives that at least tune in and see what John and Mary have to say. You know, it might be something different. Maybe, maybe you will learn something, or maybe you'll at least figure there's something worth trying. So we're uh, we've like tripled our attendance of this five o'clock presentation in the last couple of years. So let's triple it again and triple it again and triple it again. Certainly all the forces are out there. The truth is gotten out because of smartphones and computers that you can't hide. Liars, cheaters, and polluters, we're going to get you. You're not going to be able to hide. <laughs> that was a fun hour. Thanks, Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougall and Mary. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We'll see you all next Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.